thank you very much for inviting to be here, Mark. Uh, I, too, am a complete imposter. Uh, in fact, I think I have a greater degree of impostorial authenticity than the previous speaker. <laughs> takes, takes some pride in that. Uh, I, I was paid to be an evolutionary biologist, but I have a very deep interest in the inklings. And also, Owen Barfield, who, as I've already alluded to, was arguably the greatest of them, if also famously the latest of, the, of them. And so, of course, I won't talk about him at all yet. Um, what I wanted to introduce very briefly, and I enjoy doing this because the next thing you'll do, or maybe at the end, is say, which way did you vote? Well, you, by the time I finish, you'll probably guess, never mind, um, was uh, the, a simple question, which I think ultimately has some bearing on what Barfield uh, was trying to explain to us, uh, though I'm not sure he ever put it quite in this way. Uh, and I need to put another health warning in here, um, because I'm going to be talking a little bit about animal cognition, of which, fortunately, I know next to nothing. Uh, that is because I read other people's papers. Other people's papers are generally much more interesting than mine, and they're generally more accurate. So on that basis, I proceed. And the question is very simple. Uh, why don't animals speak? Why don't they have language? And this is an old trope. And I should say, by immediate introduction, that I, too, have a dog. So we all know about animals of one sort and the other. They're conscious. They have emotions. I'm not disputing any of that. In fact, if they didn't, they probably wouldn't be animals. They might be plants, but plants sometimes are said to have emotions as well. Careful, careful. Uh, and so on. I, I can't speak to bacteria. Um, so the, 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 the oddest thing is um, that Tom Sudendorf, who I've not met, wrote a, I found a very interesting book some years ago called The Gap. Uh, and this is really, what is it which separates ourselves from all other animals? Because here you are. At, at, well, some of you are asleep already, and I congratulate you, uh, attentively uh, listening to me plowing on for a couple of minutes. Um, now, animals certainly communicate, they vocalise, but they don't ever use language. And the general argument, of course, is we have slightly bigger brains, or much bigger brains, and all of this is an additive process. And just in case anybody's panicking, um, I have no doubt that we are very closely related to primates, and there's a genealogy which you can trace through the fossil record and through molecular biology, and this is unequivocal as far as I'm concerned. So what is it which they have, which at first sight looks just like language? And the apes are pretty hopeless in this area. I'll come back to an example in a slightly different context, which will offend the remaining half of you in just a moment. Um, and that's to do with birdsong, because in the case of birdsong, um, it is claimed that they have a, something like a syntax, and they can reorganize phrases, in inverted commas, into, into different contexts. Even more startling is the young birds, and these are the ones which are taught songs, not the ones which have it as an innate property. Um, uh, they're normally taught by their dads, make of that what you will. Um, it, it is that um, they go through the so-called babbling phase, which are children. And I remember with delight my two boys, when they were very young, both going through this remarkable where they experiment with the language, and it crystallizes. And goodness me, they're speaking English. Um, that's very analogous to what we do. And many of these similarities, which interesting because the birds come from dinosaurs and we come from another pack of reptiles, means that it's evolved convergently, which I'm also quite interested in. But despite that, the fact of the matter is um, that their language, bird song, has absolutely no depth at all. It's got no recursive properties worth speaking of. But even more crucially, even if they can swap the phrases around, um, they don't actually um, export it in any other context. So it's used mostly for sexual communication, and sometimes defence and so forth. But it's never used for you know, any other thing. There's no poetry there. Sorry, Malcolm, but anyway. Um, or perhaps there is. Perhaps I'm just not listening carefully enough. And a slightly analogous example is to do with the famous vervet monkeys. And they have these three so-called words, one for eagle, one for snake, one for leopard. And every now and again, I do slow, show a slide which shows a, 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 an eagle on top of a vert monkey. So obviously it didn't work too well that time, did it? Um, but again, further experimentation or observation shows that it's entirely, uh, entirely misunderstanding to call these things words. They are not conveying meaning. And there are many similar experiments with dogs and so forth. We can unpack that. And I'm sure there's some specialists here who would probably take issue with what I have to say. And so we can go on and on in these sort of directions. So what is the nature of this gap? 
Well, I don't have an explanation, otherwise I'd be across to Stockholm to get that famous prize. Um, the, 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 the thing, it seems to me that I came across recently an essay which was dealing with some ideas stemming from uh, Thomas Aquinas. And again, Malcolm will correct me because uh, he knows about the air in a way I never will. Um, but there's the suggestion is effectively that rather than, our trans, uh, rather than us being an additive sort of ape, slightly clever and all the rest of us, we've undergone a transformation. We've actually been invited into completely new worlds. And having done that, of course, everything changes forever, irreversibly. I don't understand when it happened. Some people say 100,000 years ago, some people say with the older one, culture. And in point of fact, I don't think it really matters because we ourselves actually are lucky enough, as was hinted at earlier in the discussion, that the consciousness which was behind us is actually governing who we are. And we, again, are actually influencing what's gonna happen in the deep future. And part of that, of course, is actually that what we think is time, and this is going off on a complete tangent, I'm afraid to tell you, isn't what your clock says, but that's another story. Um, so this is not at all a coherent description of why Barfield matters so very much, but I think that he, in his exploration of the evolution of our consciousness, which I think must be correct, but also his enormous influence he had on Tolkien, and also Lewis in a different sort of way, whom I have unlimited admi admiration for, because as was already hinted by other speakers, um, it is this question of the imagination. And I keep on asking myself, and I say I'm almost out of time now, thank goodness, is what, what is it about Tolkien's world which is so utterly convincing? Why does it, to some of us, ring so completely true? And you can approach this from an English literary perspective and various other things and the fact the old boy spent a large amount of time in the attic on his typewriter correcting 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 all oh, that's true but I end up with a very uneasy feeling which is echoed I believe in one of his letters where he says somebody came up to him in the street and again Malcolm probably the reference straight away so I keep on pointing to my friend Malcolm here but it's because I rely on him um, well, it, 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 he, this chap came up to the street out of the unknown now, this has happened to me a couple of times not in that context we were talking briefly with a colleague, Oops. With a, colleague um, uh, a few minutes ago about synchronicities. And this chap said to, to, to Tolkien, uh, Mr. Tolkien, you, you, you don't think you invented that world, do you? And disappeared. Or well, not literally, that happens sometimes as well. So in conclusion, I think this aspect of Barfield is one which opens such an interesting perspective on the way that we use our language and the invitation, even more through poetry, of which I am a complete amateur, um, that it sounds all rather emotional and sort of getting too excited and all the rest of it. But it is really, you know, our path forward. So I've said far too much already, and I'll let more cogent people pick up the pieces. So thank you very much, Jenny. Thanks. Thank you.